Hey everybody and welcome to Bright Founders Talk at Temi. Temi is an international software development company that designs, builds and delivers software for sustainable businesses and promising startups. Welcome to our podcast where we bring you the most inspiring stories of entrepreneurs and experts in the software development industry. Each week we interview successful leaders who share their unique journeys and valuable insights. I'm your host Barry. Now today we're lucky enough to have a remarkable guest joining us, Tim Miller, who is co-founder and CEO at CertifiD. Hello Tim, welcome to the podcast. Hi Barry, great to be here. Thanks a lot for the uh, opportunity to to talk. Lovely, thank you for coming. How are you doing today? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. I'm good. Yeah, very good. Good. So thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to speak with us. I'd like to start by talking about who you are truly on a personal level and the amazing journey that you had. But before we do that, would you mind just telling us a little bit about yourself and the company that you work at? Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, I'm originally from the UK uh, and founded Certified E three years ago with the goal of sort of bridging international talent and skill gaps. So helping people with skills to, to make them move to countries where there's a huge need for, for skilled talent. Um, from a background perspective, yeah, I spent um, a lot of time traveling uh, all over the world um, throughout my entire life, uh, and, uh, which was, I guess, one of the family reasons as to why I wanted to try and create Certified E2 to, to solve some of the challenges that I saw in that journey. Perfect. What inspired you to start Certified E? You, you, you did touch briefly on it there. Could you just share the story behind its inception? So um, I worked for a, a multinational German company for yeah, 16 years or so. And a lot of that time was in the education and, and training field um, and then international. So bridging yeah, China through to Mexico and everything in between, really. Uh, I spent a lot of time, particularly in India. So I lived in Bangalore in India for a number of years where I saw that people were willing to spend an awful lot of money to get themselves trained and to get certain skills and certifications with the hope of an aspiration of going and working abroad. And the reality was that there was a, a huge gap in reality in terms of, you know, the, the skills that people were, yeah, were developing and what was truly required in particularly developed economies like, like Germany, like the UK, US, and so on. Um, and I saw this very firsthand because my role was trying to sort of roll the German dual vocational training, so apprenticeship model. Um, from from taking you know huge success stories from Germany and, and and making that possible or experimenting with that in developing economies and this was really the combination of seeing the challenges and 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 so on that people face in trying to reach these aspirational goals of going overseas and then seeing what skills were actually required on the, on the German side um, was really kind of the catalyst that said surely there's a better way of doing this and a better way of bringing transparency and trust into the skills that people have. Um, and and supporting them in taking that journey overseas. So what was it specifically about the German model that drew you to want to follow that particular avenue? Yeah, I mean, the German dual vocational model is, is yeah, has been in existence for more than 60 years. And basically, it's a very strong relationship between um, education and industry, which is a huge component in, in Germany. So I think there's a statistic that something like 60% of German CEOs went through a vocational training and apprenticeship path, which is completely different to markets like like the UK, um, for example. And basically what it means is that training always results in industry-ready candidates. Uh, so if you look at, for example, at Siemens, for example, and you see their graduate program in Germany or their apprenticeship program in Germany, when someone completes that course, they're ready to be fully functional and operational on, on the shop floor, for example. Whereas in India, there's a still another year or so to go to actually get someone ready because it's very theoretical learning. So I think from a German side, they've done it really well. It's not easy to replicate because it's very embedded in sort of the, the last 60 years of, of German economic development, but a, an aspirational model. Thank you very much for telling us about that. What was your life like prior to starting Certified E? Yeah, so I, following uni, I joined, as I said, joined a multinational company, TUV Rhineland, um, which which has you know operations in sixty odd countries around the world, and I actually started working for them in Japan. So I uh, had a very international career from the from the get go. Lived in Japan, Australia, Dubai, India, and then moved to Germany. So very much you know jet setting around and and doing different roles for for a multinational company which for me was really exciting because I always wanted um, change. And, and you know, if I was in a place for more than more than three, four years, I always got a bit itchy feet and wanted to do something new, which I guess is kind of the entre- entrepreneurial spirit that led me in the end to trying to set up my own company. Um, 
but it was a very yeah comfortable good a great company great you know very comfortable ride had a good successful career um, in a corporate role really for the first 16 years of my my professional career so relatively comfortable <laughs> it's been slightly different since <laughs> so as you were growing up did you always see yourself as being an entrepreneur or was it something that you kind of just found yourself falling into I mean, it's an interesting question. So I, I never, um, so as a, as a kid, I never, um, I guess specifically said, I'm going to be an entrepreneur. My, my parents were, you know, a, a teacher and also in a multinational career with a, with a corporate company, my, from, from my dad's perspective. So I didn't necessarily have entrepreneurial roots in the family, if you like. Um, but I think from, from always being sort of starting to, to join the workforce, my interest was always doing things new. And, and I think the biggest challenge I found working in a corporate, especially a, a, a German quite regulated corporate, was there are quite strong guardrails about what you can do and can't do and, and sort of a very regulated environment. And that was always something that, yeah, I felt was um, a hindrance to growth and something that uh, I always wanted to stretch a bit beyond. How do you navigate that challenge of seeing seeing these guardrails and thinking like do, do you have to like work within them? Obviously, if there are like regulatory requirements, and you do, but how do you kind of maximize um, that particular? Some might say weakness, but definitely this kind of field of you know you, you're kind of guardrailed into doing something that you might not necessarily want to do. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, at the end of the day, it's the same with most things. It's, at the, it's, it's about network. It's about communication and so on, right? So you, you've got to make, you know, friends in the right places who can enable you to to test certain things or push certain boundaries. So I think that's definitely something that I enjoyed doing was, you know, trying to yeah challenge the norm a little bit, but with with a bit of logic behind it and uh, being careful not to overstep, but but always pushing. And I think that with most companies or most corporates that innovation is a huge topic. I don't think a lot of companies really truly know what it means, to be honest. Um, but, you know, the idea of, of having an innovation structure within a company to change norms is very much commonplace or very commonplace. And that's something I also tried to latch on to wherever there was an opportunity to test certain things. I was always sort of first in line to do that. So I think it's a combination of knowing the right people, having trust from the right people to, to, to get going um, and, uh, yeah, and, and finding avenues to make it possible. So you made the comment there that not a lot of companies know what innovation is. I don't want to throw you in the hot water, but what does innovation mean to you, Tim? I mean, I think that it's an interesting one because innovation and, and startups are also quite different. Yeah? So, of course, you know, to, to have a successful startup, you need to be innovative. You need to do things differently or find the right market that uh, is, is completely the right fit and relevant for what for what you do. Um, I think in a, in a corporate setting, um, innovation often is a trend. Yeah, So we want to show whether it's in our corporate sustainability reports or whatever, we want to show that we're, we're quite innovative. Um, and a lot of that innovation often comes from R&D, depending on the, the sector you're in. And that's tremendous. Yeah? So R&D, for sure, is, is massive. It's all about innovation and huge budgets are spent on that. Um, but I think depending on the industry sector you're in, it's, it's more of a, a concept of, you know, let's see if we can build a new service that can make some money that's a little bit outside of our core, core portfolio. Um, but it's seen as projects and seen as projects and a project has to show success relatively quickly or it gets stopped relatively quickly. And I think that, again, that the, the journey is if you truly want to innovate and, and sort of disrupt or challenge the norm, it's not something that can happen overnight. Uh, and it's not just something you can throw money at or, or throw a couple of resources at. You really need to dedicate um, effort to making that possible. And I think that's where there's there's a little bit of a at least in my experience, some challenges in uh, in sort of yeah connecting the dots, if you like. Perfect. Um, so you mentioned earlier about the jet setting and you travelled all over the world. Have you managed to pick up uh, some of the local language? And if you have, uh, have you found that beneficial for your journey? And if you haven't, has it been a barrier? Yeah. So I think it's also an interesting one. So I mean, I um, I learned quite a lot of Japanese. So my Japanese for a long time was okay. So sort of sort of entry level business Japanese, and I could get around and, and make a good impression. Have to admit, I haven't used it in the last twelve years, so it's a little bit uh, a little bit rusty. My German's okay, so I'm married to a German. I know a lot of uh, words that I probably shouldn't in German, and uh, but it's it's not bad. So um, uh, it it's uh, it works, and I can understand a lot. 
I think for me, being English, to be honest, has been an Achilles heel in many way. In many ways, yeah, it's been a huge strength working internationally that you have, you know, very comfortable, yeah, very strong English language skills, which obviously is an international, the international business language. And with that, you always kind of lean back on the fact that you expect everybody else to speak English, which is a terrible thing. Um, and uh, and and therefore, it's something that I wish I'd spent more time on was getting more languages. Has it been a barrier? No. Would I like to be, you know, fluent in many, you know, several languages? Absolutely. And it's something that I would change if I had the opportunity to do it again. So how do you relax? Obviously, you're a busy person. You've got lots of requirements and competing demands. What is it that you do to just give yourself some new space? So I, um, I have four kids and a dog. So, yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's also not been the... Uh, the 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 most recommended way of starting a company starting a company and going to that journey because that you you have you really have two lives and you have to to switch between two if if I want to be a good dad then then I have to find a way of switching off and and, and playing that role which is in many ways a more important job than than founding a startup yeah so um, I think for me in time I'm sport is important um, spending time with the family is important and travel yeah? and travel has been something that obviously for all of us has been very yeah, limited over the last couple of years um, and something that with a startup also is challenging to to travel but that's something that's de- definitely on my radar is to to uh, travel more privately again trying to and and showing the kids more of the world which uh, which obviously I, I got the chance to do when I was growing up do you find it easy to draw that distinction between family life and business life? Is it something that you naturally switch from one to the other? Or do you find yourself falling foul of, oh, just a little bit more time on this or a little bit more time on that? No, it's 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 really, really challenging. Um, yeah, there's just, there's always so many things to do. And, and you know, you can say, oh, I sit at my desk for 10 hours a day or 11 hours a day, and then, then you try and switch off. But you always have this friendly little phone with you that, that somehow talks to you all the time. And for me, it's not so much about, you know, the definition of work. My, my mind's always going. And I think that's that's the challenge is how do you actually switch your mind off? Uh, you know, you can switch off all your devices and say, I'm done. But you're, you're constantly thinking of the next thing or solving the next challenge or, or whatever. And that's the hardest thing for me is, is finding that way to really switch off. Um, yeah, and, and I just have to be busy. The only way is to be busy, um, either out, you know, playing tennis or, or going out or whatever, doing something different. Otherwise, it's very difficult to switch switch your brain off completely. So you're like a subscriber to the old adage, work hard, play hard. That's yeah, kind of... <laughs> I, to, I always I mean, I live, live 24 hours a day. I think you have to. And the only only way to is at, at all succeed in this is to, is to do that, but cannot only be work. You need to mix and match with different pieces of your life. Perfect. So... Like, how do you how do you perform? Are you most efficient? Is it like morning? Are you a morning person? Are you an evening person? Or are you always like high energy regardless of the time of the day? I would say I'm more of a morning person. Yeah. So I think for multiple reasons. One, we we have a company in India, so time zone wise, you know, my morning is always much busier when the team is is up and running. And yeah, I tend to get a lot more done in the morning, and then try and and move towards actually doing doing real work in the afternoon, if you like, and not just being on the on the phone or being on Zoom calls all day. Um, so that's that tends to be the way. Perfect. Lovely. Um, so if you could describe yourself in three words, which words would you choose and why? I, I think driven would be one. So driven. So, you know, I, and the reason for that was that I yeah, don't like to sit still and always set myself targets, whether that's personal or in work. I, I'm driven towards certain successes, whatever that may be. Yeah. So I think I think that would that would be the um, the one. I think impatient, which is not always a good thing. I, I have to admit. So I, I I like to get things done very quickly and 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 expect people around me to do that as well. Which yeah, in many ways is good because you're driving a team to succeed and, and hit targets. But but of course, at the same time, you need to have patience in certain situations and and so on as well. And I think I think family would be the other. Yeah. So for sure. Everyone who knows me, family is 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 always my number one priority. So I think that's also a word is family. Yeah? So whether it's you know um, yeah my my parents and so on or, or my kids, I think family is, is is critical to me as well. How do you stay motivated and inspired as an entrepreneur, especially 
during times when the journey feels particularly challenging or demanding? It's an interesting one because, I, you know, there are many days where you think, oh, there's another challenge or another problem and so on. And you often stop to, you'll forget to stop and think about the successes that you've had um, and the growth that you've had as a company because with growth comes new challenge and, and it's not always rosy when you're growing. Yeah, I think, I, you know, th those are things which I think you had to do. So if you see, uh, it, like, let's say every day you have a challenge, in your mind, do you think, oh, it's another challenge. Can you not give me one day where things just run smoothly? Or do you find it, you embrace it and you find it kind of inspiring to be faced with difficulty uh, every day? Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, without without challenge, there's, you know, you're not growing, right? So, and I think that therefore, there's always, it's always important to be challenged. It doesn't mean problems. And I think there's a difference between a problem and a challenge. And problems I could do do without, that'd be great. <laughs> um, but challenges need to be there, right? Challenge, what what's the market, what next, or what market next, or what team to bring on board, or, or what, to, what to address in the next team stand-up call, or, or whatever. These are all challenges of different magnitude, which you have to deal with all the time, which is about growth. And that for me is, is super important. So of these challenges, what is the most valuable lesson that you've learned along the way? Yeah, so I think, I mean, for me, we, we as a company, setting up the company, we didn't have this smoothest of starts in terms of legal framework and structure. So I learned an awful lot about what not to do or the challenges that could have been avoided if we'd done things in different ways. And predominantly, again, setting up a company in Germany as a German legal entity for me as an as as a as a Brit and and uh yeah, not not being fluent in the language was a real challenge. And you have to rely almost entirely on other people to guide you. And while I have no problem doing that, it's always nice to have a bit of your own say when it's your company and you're putting an awful lot of on the line to make that happen. So without doubt, the biggest challenges that we've had as a company and I've had personally in the entrepreneurial world have come from how the company was set up in the initial couple of years of that journey, which thankfully is completely sorted now and we're, we're on a much better track but it was a, a massive learning curve that was quite painful not that i want you to give advice to your competitors but if anyone was out there looking to set up a, a company abroad based on your own challenges what advice would you give to them yeah i mean i think i think one make sure you've got the right advice around you right and and don't be afraid to spend the money to get that advice because in the long run it will absolutely pay dividends right so i think that's something which in the journey you think this is ridiculous you're paying a fortune for advice and tax and legal advice and so on yeah but but it's something that that you can't replace that when you actually you know go forward as a company and you have that foundation set so that would be my advice don't don't <laughs> underestimate the support you need and don't panic about paying for it Perfect. Lovely. Thank you. Being a little bit more idealistic now, are there any books or podcasts or documentaries that have had a, like a significant impact on your thinking or personal development or ideology? I mean, to be honest, there's there's an awful, yeah, an awful, all, awful lot of um, material out there that, that's been been relevant. But for me, quite honestly, it's the people around me, right? So whether that's you know mentors that I've had in, in the company, whether that's family members or friends, I think I've taken an awful lot from experience of the people around me in more communicational context and so on. I'm not the biggest uh, biggest reader, uh, so I think um, I, I very much rely on on the experiences around me and the experiences I've gained from 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 what I've the people I've met all over the world. So I think those are the things that that really have you know taught me an awful lot, good and bad, and um, obviously supplemented with with uh, lots of other information and reading along the way as well. So if you were to like using your imaginative creative side for a moment, uh, if you were to create like a tagline or a slogan for a certified style of a movie poster. What would it say and what imagery would accompany it? You know, probably, I mean, I was, I was thinking of a, sort of quote, some, a quote that I, I sort of link myself to to quite a lot is that life begins at the end of your comfort zone. And I think that, um, and, and I think that's very relevant for, for our company because, you know, I think, um, you know, what, what we're basically doing is is helping people have trust and faith in in taking a leap of faith and moving overseas and and for sure that's at the end of your comfort zone right so i think what all of what we're doing is supporting people and having enough confidence in taking that leap of faith and going to the end of your comfort zone and living life right so i think i think that would be a, a great one i think um as a tagline and i think that you know um in terms of what it, the look and feel of what that would look like i think it's all about people yeah, so it's about people with different skills and different backgrounds and, and focused on skills and not where you're from and so on. So I think it's an army of people with certain skills that are not afraid to go to the end of their comfort zone. 
There you go. Could you tell me a little bit about the dynamics within your team and, and, and like how you navigate the challenges of working together towards a common goal? Because people are ultimately individual, right? So it's, I, I know that when I'm speaking to people, it's kind of hard to kind of get everyone on the same page. How do you do that? Yeah, I mean, I mean, you have to have a, um, a strong team around you. So I think that one of the things I learned was, although I mean, I have a co-founder in the business, but a non-operational co-founder. So pretty much from the beginning, I've been on my own as a as a founder of the company. I think that's well, that's one thing that I would definitely change is is having someone operationally who complements you tremendously. So I know there are a lot of things I'm not good at, and and there are a lot of people who are far better at many things than me. So to have someone on the team from the get go that could match with with, with that part uh, or, or be part of that journey is is really important. So I didn't have that, but saying that I've got some very key people around me that have been tremendously supportive from day one of the journey, um, starting with friends. So a couple of friends that joined on pretty early, which which is um, which is great because you have people you trust around you, but also challenging because sometimes you know you have to make tough calls and so on um, as well. Um, and I think for me, um, we do have two companies. Right? So we have our head office in Germany and we have a, have a legal entity in India as well, which has now 20 people or something, yeah? so, or 20, 22 people. Um, so grown really quickly and you have to have people that you trust to be leaders, in, 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 especially when you're not there in person and, and so on. So I think that that leadership team is really important. And I think communication is the second piece. So you have to communicate, you have to be visible, you have to be there. Um, and and that builds trust and, and starts to create a, a culture in the company, and and on that I had a we had a stand up call about well, it was a couple of months ago now, but it was a big change in the company because the stand up um, which was you know, ended up being 27, 28 people or nearly thirty people at the time. Um, one of the questions was asked is is how about our corporate culture? And uh, and for me that was a that's kind of a light bulb moment because I've always you know built this company from one person, two people, three people, and you don't even think about the fact that you're getting to a point where that becomes important. And it is, and you've got a team now which which wasn't with you from founding that is an operational team that you've hired on board, and you have to take that step in transitioning into my role, transitioning my role into more of a. a leading the company and leading teams as opposed to operational management and, and i think that's you have to have the team around that you that can support you in doing that as well was that an easy step for you to go from that small and kind of highly controlled personally environment to something a little bigger where you may not have the level of oversight that you might desire I think I think there are two two things to that. So uh, straight up answer is no, um, but I think there are two reasons for that. One is um, COVID. So uh, you know, I, I basically, well, we as a company built the team up virtually. Uh, so you know, for a, a long period of time, there were about fifteen people in the company. I hadn't met twelve of them, yeah? and so and and met, never met them in person. I'm a very and I like personal contact. I like you know seeing and feeling a team and, and understanding uh, understanding the dynamics of that team. So that that was one, and I think I uh, also for me as a manager, something I've tried to work on is is being able to have confidence in remote teams and remote management. And obviously, there's so much talk about you know the value of remote and all this kind of stuff. Where I fully appreciate that. Also, I have struggled to constantly have trust in that structure. Yeah? And uh, again, therefore, the only way to solve that is to find the right people who take that over that responsibility over from you and then you can continue to move on so i think yeah it's it's been a it, it's it's not so easy but if you've got the right team and then you can adapt and it works as you're growing uh and you're looking to take on new people what qualities are you looking for in new team members so i think i um, mean obviously you know a real interest in what we do right so a lot of what we're doing has an impact so although we're you know a for-profit company a lot of what we're doing definitely has an impact value in terms of changing people's livelihoods and opportunities and so on so there has to be that kind of entrepreneurial spirit of making a bit of a difference in what we're what we're doing and i think that that's the gel that keeps everyone together and so i think if you're if you're on that same page whatever challenges you know there's a a, a great vision not just making money for a founder yeah so it has to be it has to be um something more or in that line yeah i mean i think um trust is a key part and and general skill sets right so you've got to find people that really have the skills have a passion and are people that you can uh, ideally get along with yeah so that that's the at least where we are now that's what i try to look for so as you were as you were growing the company did you employ any like unique methods or approaches to help you attract the right world-class talent at certified 
I mean, it's always a difficult finding finding good people is really challenging. I mean, we're going through a, a growth period at the moment as well, and it is difficult. Yeah. So whether that is compensation challenges where you are, I mean, we are a technology company and we're competing with some companies that can for sure pay an awful lot more money than we can, right? So I think that's that's one where again the focus on our goals as a company, the impact of our company. I think from my perspective, I also try and be quite involved in as many sort of interviews as I can at whatever level. So regardless of if they're my direct report or not, at least I try and be there for 10 or 15 minutes to give my little piece on on the company and 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 get to know somebody a little bit. So I, I would I would say that's something that we try and do um, try and do as well, whether it's me or, or other members of the leadership team. Yeah, and I think it's 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 really about about the message, the opportunity. We definitely have a big vision of what we want to achieve as a company. So there's huge growth opportunities. So we definitely leverage or lean on that combination of things. But I think there's no golden ticket. People are different and, and respond differently to different uh, different stimulus. So yeah. So it's interesting to hear you talking about like like that hiring philosophy. Have you ever had a situation where you saw someone and you just thought they've got all the right personality traits that will make this successful, but they lack the skills? Or vice versa, have you had someone who has all the right skills, but not the right uh, personality traits? And if you have come across that situation, did you did you employ them and look to mold them? Or did you think actually the investment required to get that person to where I need, would want them to be is just too much? Um, I think so. Uh, so to answer them both, I think the the second one. So finding someone with all the skills but not the right fit, absolutely. But no, we didn't hire them. Yeah. So I think you know um, our business is all about building people and getting the right skills or developing skills to help people achieve certain things. So I think a lot of what we do is bring on younger talent. So um, you know people in the, in their twenties who are either quite fresh out of out of out of school or university. Um, or a couple of years experience and I have a real personal passion of, of coaching mentoring and, and, and working with people so for me that's that's a much better option yeah um, I think again you know we we've hired a CTO recently as well and that's a very different game so you're definitely looking for someone with the skills but also someone that I would have to work with very closely on a daily basis so that's also inc- incredibly important to get that right and that was I guess, yeah, anyway, the most important decision from a hiring perspective that we could ever make as a company. And I think we've done a really good job. So, yeah, I, I think, you know, um, different different ways. I would definitely pick a person with skills, obviously not someone who doesn't have any, any no, no clue what you're talking about. But I like to mold people. And as a company, we try and nurture that prospect of you know, developing talent into what we want them to to be able to achieve. And many of the people who watch this might be our oncoming entrepreneurs you've been through that journey yourself what advice would you give someone who is an aspiring entrepreneur and who maybe is a bit on the fence and like you said earlier about not wanting to make that leap of faith and they're quite comfortable in their comfort zone an awful lot of them in the corporate world right um a lot of people have great ideas but um you have to be willing to sacrifice certain securities and i think i mean everyone will tell you tell you the same but it isn't it for sure isn't an easy journey I would say really do whatever you can to create a stable baseline before you take that jump, right? And that's whether that is financial, whether that is family, preparing people for that journey ahead, whether that is uh, whatever it may be that you need to do to set yourself as a, as, a, as a stable baseline helps tremendously because there will be huge ups and downs in that journey, uh, really huge ups and downs. And um, yeah, if you are if you do get insecure or you're nervous about money, you're nervous about paying the bills at the end of the month and, and so on, the finances for me in particular are the biggest nerve wrecker. Yeah, so being able to pay my team, being able to support my family, those are things which you have to be able to figure out or figure out how to deal with that. Otherwise, it will drive you crazy. So I think that baseline is super important. And whether that is, you know, you've worked a while and saved some money and you have a little, at least a little net, nest egg for a couple of years, which you can lean back on if, if it doesn't work. And again, it often doesn't, is important or find the right partners. That's the other thing. Make sure you don't do it alone. If you're, you know, if there are weaknesses in your armor, find someone who can, who can patch them up very well. Yeah? So that's the other side. Really good advice. Thank you very much for sharing that with us. So we are coming towards the end of the interview slightly, but let's just throw to, um, maybe creative questions out to you. One is like, if you could swap places with any co-founder or entrepreneur for a day, who would it be? And what would you hope to learn from that experience? Um, I, I had, uh, we were fortunate enough to go on a, a selected for an accelerator program, German, a German accelerator program a couple of years ago, with the goal of taking our business overseas. And I had the chance to work with a lot of 
companies at different levels of their journey. And there was one in particular, a guy I got along very well well with, who was one of the founders of a company called Apoclar, which is a, uh, they're basically a um, VR, AR, VR um, a company that builds software for the medical industry. So doing remote surgeries and so on, using VR headsets and so on, and connecting hospitals and doctors in from different environments. And they were interesting because they were quite a bit ahead of us in terms of their journey, um, but were facing an awful lot of uh, a lot of different challenges. And I think that if I could choose to yeah, switch seats with someone, it would be someone at the next step of that journey, not someone who's made it because, yeah, whatever, everyone has their own journey. But I think there's an awful lot of lessons still being learned and a long, long way to go to, to truly, you know, get beyond the startup stage and be a more mature company. And that next step, I would very much like to step in and uh, and work with a company that one has a product that is really exciting, two has gone through different levels of funding journeys and has a, a good team that I get along with and, and could work alongside. So that would be an interesting one for me. Yeah, it's fascinating that you just go one step up uh, rather than many people, they, they want to see what the, the top performers, people who have made it, as you said. But it's interesting that you do that because it probably could be a lot more for you to learn, isn't there, from someone who is just a little bit ahead in the race than you. Um, and how you would get to the next level. So that's fascinating. Um, one last question. If there was any problem in the world that you could solve overnight, what would you choose to solve and why? Honestly, I would st- I would stick with what we're doing. Yeah? So, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, we're working in companies like India, which has this huge demographic dividend. Yeah? So there's a, a billion billion working age population that is often very skilled um, but, but has a, a limited um, limited opportunity and globally you know economies and businesses are really suffering because they can't find enough people to do certain jobs and I think that that's what what drove me to set up certified ID and and the different solutions that we offer as a company and I wouldn't change that direction I mean there's of course I'd love to make the world a a healthier, safer, you know, place for sure. But I think, um, you know, enabling people with skills to get that opportunity also creates innovation and stimulates change and growth. And I think with that, that you never know what can come out of that. If you give someone the opportunity to spread their wings and grow, they may have the next idea that could, you know, you know, solve climate change. You never know. So I think, um, you know, that I, I think sticking with what we're doing, giving people the opportunity or opening doors to help them succeed and change their economic situation um, and solve some of the the problems that developed economies have in terms of finding the right people to do jobs, I think is what I would still very much like to do. Lovely. Thank you. Tim, I just want to thank you again for taking the time to talk with us today. It's been a pleasure talking with you and I hope that you've enjoyed your time with us. Yes, very much. Thanks, Barry. Appreciate it. Yeah, the good discussion. Enjoy it. <laughs> thank you so much. That was Tim Miller, co-founder and CEO at Certified E.